Um, we finished looking at, at Genesis chapter 1, um, and just wanted to start with, are there any questions on, on what we looked at last week, any of the days, any of the things that we discussed? Okay, um, what I would like to do then is, um, top of the next page, is that page 17? Okay, top of page 17 has, uh, read Genesis chapter 2, verses 4 through 25. Um, we're going to look at this tonight. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time on it because the majority of what we, we talked about last week already covers this. Um, as I kind of explained last week, the way that Genesis chapter 1, this isn't the way that every chapter works in the Bible, but this is the way Genesis chapters 1 and 2 work, right? Genesis chapter 1 is just kind of giving you the bullet points, right? Day one, here's what God said, here's what he created. He saw that it was good, there was evening and there was morning, day one. Day two, here's what God said, here's what he created, it was good, evening, morning, day two. Day three, day four, day five, day six, day seven. Chapter two, instead of going on to days eight, nine, ten, and so on, Genesis chapter 2 actually takes you back into that first week of creation and kind of fills in a little bit more of the details. So if you walk away from Genesis chapter 1 kind of going, wow, there, there was a lot more that I was kind of hoping to hear or wondering about. Um, I think Genesis 2 kind of fills in some of those gaps. Uh, so I put Bibles on everybody's tables, so just in case you didn't have one tonight, um, you, you, can, you can look that up right away in the beginning of the Bible, Genesis chapter 2. So um, go to the very first book, Genesis, find the big number 2, um, and we are, are going to begin in uh, verse 4. So that's the small number 4. should start right beneath the, the words Adam and Eve. Okay. So again, notice how verse 4 begins. Um, this is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. Okay, so, so that kind of opening verse already tells you, right? We're going back into the account of what we just heard. Verse 4. When the Lord God had made the earth and the heavens, and no shrub of the field had yet appeared on the earth, and no plants of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no man to work the ground. But streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. Um, the Lord God formed the man. So before we get into that, remember we, we touched on that last week, this idea of this kind of um, subterrane uh, irrigation system, right? That rose up streams, water rose up from the ground, watered the plants and the vegetation that God had just created. This is not really anything new, right? Um, Water beneath the surface of the ground still exists in the world. Um, and you still see that in places around the world um, where there um, uh, is a desert and there's an oasis. Right? Why, why is that there when there's no water present? Well, because there's water beneath the ground right? that, that provides water to those plants. So that, that still happens. That isn't anything that should uh, appear out of the norm. Verse 7. The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. When we look back in chapter 1, it, it just kind of seemed like God created mankind, Adam and Eve, as we'll, we'll, we'll hear. Seems like he just kind of created them like everything else, right? Let us make man in our image, we heard God say last week. Um, and all of a sudden... There was man, right? There was, there was a man, there was a woman. But now we see kind of the details of exactly how God did that. Um, and, and he goes into this great detail on how he created humanity. And, and that really should begin to kind of give us this idea, this understanding, this impression that God holds mankind in this special regard. He doesn't do this for anything else. Um, not the majestic sun, moon, and stars, that he just simply says, let there be lights in the sky that govern the day and the night and the time and the seasons, and they're there. But for human beings, God does something 
a little different. Um, he spends time um, shaping and forming uh, man out of the dust of the ground. And, and this really kind of weird picture. Um, and if you can envision this shape of a human being um, in, in, in dirt. And, and God kneeling down and breathing into this pile of dirt. Seems like a weird picture. But we're going we're gonna to hear this later on in uh, was it, Lesson 9. When we get into our lesson on the Word of God, on the Bible, what we believe the Bible is. And we'll, we'll look at this passage that says, All Scripture is God-breathed. It's not very often that we hear in Scripture that God breathes into something. Um, but when he does, you'll notice something always happens. Whatever God breathes into, it becomes alive. Because that is what God is. He is the one who creates life. And so where the breath of God is, life itself will exist. Um, and so this isn't God just saying, um, boom, give me, give me a man, and there's Adam. Um, God breathes a part of himself into this pile of dust, um, and this pile of dust becomes a living being. Um, let, let's, let's go on. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. And the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river watering the garden flowed from Eden. From there it was separated into four headwaters. The name of the first is the Pishon. It winds through the entire land of Havilah, where there is gold. The gold of that land is good, aromatic, resin, and onyx are also there. The name of the second river is the, the Gihon. It winds through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is the Tigris. It runs along the east side of Asher. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree that is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when <coughs> excuse me, when you eat of it, you will surely die. The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. That though, there's another phrase that should just leap off the page. Um, almost like a, a CD stuck on repeat, right? At the end of every day, what do we hear God say? Right? He looked at all that he had made and it was good. It was good. It was good. It was good. Here's the first time we hear God say something is not good. Um, Adam is alone. And God says that is not good. Um, here's another example where um, we see in the account of creation, something that the, the Bible tells us, that God says, that we see live out in the created world in which we live. Um, this idea of companionship. Um, I, I don't care how much people want to try and convince me that they are a loner, that they don't need anyone in their life. That they would just as soon everybody leave them alone. It's not true. Uh, why do you think solitary confinement is still one of the most aggressive and most, I guess, beneficial ways to punish a, a criminal? Because once you are completely shut off from the rest of humanity around you, you go nuts. And here, here's what we see God say. It's not good to be alone. And it's not just like, uh, have anybody watched that show on Fox, The, the Last Man on Earth? Um, it just, I don't know, I think it's in the second season. It's not bad. Uh, it just, it kind of envisions a post-apocalyptic world, right? And there's one guy left, but in reality, 
you can't have an entire movie or a television series with just one guy wandering the earth. So I think it was about five minutes into the first episode, he found someone else, and then they found someone else, and now there's like 30 people. Um, so I don't really know how much the title, The Last Man on Earth, really fits anymore. Um, but it, you, you get that sense of um, not just being alone, like I don't have any friends, but being alone in the sense that there is absolutely no one else with whom I can communicate, uh, in whom I can show my trust, my love, my affection, no one with whom I can build a relationship, uh, no one uh, with whom I can confide in. Um, this whole idea of everything that we find beneficial in companionship. We say it's one of the great blessings of being married um, is regardless of how much of a schmuck I am, I know that every morning when I wake up, there's going to be someone next to me. That's comforting. Um, and, and, and that really should be empowering enough for me to stop being a schmuck. Um, because that's the beauty of companionship. And we hear God say exactly that. Here's how I'm creating human beings. You're not meant to be alone. Now, it doesn't mean that every human being of, of all time has to get married and be married. Um, it, that's not what God is saying, necessarily. He's going to give Adam a wife. Um, but I think even if you're single, even if you're not married, you understand, I can only go home alone so often before I long for that fellowship, that companionship, hanging out with people, having someone to talk to face to face. And God says, yeah, that's why, I, that's how I created human beings. It's not good for you to be alone. So God's going to address that. And, and this is amazing. The very first thing that God says, it's not good, um, immediately he goes to work on fixing it. Verse uh, 19. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field and all the birds of the air. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds of the air and all the beasts of the field. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. The man and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. Um, <clears throat> we worked through a number of these bullet points, but look at your notes at the one, two, three, uh, four, the verse 23. Consider Adam's statement um, in light of what task he had just completed. God gave him this amazing task of naming all of the animals. And I remember I had somebody in basic Christianity class uh, a couple of years ago tell me, um, I'm good with creation. I'm good with granting God the power of creating all things by His spoken word. Um, I'm good with everything, but I have a problem with the fact that Adam, somehow in the matter of one day, gave a name to every living creature. There just wouldn't seem to be time. I think that, that's, a, that's a pretty valid point, a, a concern to make. But I think we have to remember, um, I think because of the time from then to now, um, all the different types, different types of species that have been um, crossbreeding and, 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 and created um, and brought about through that process, um, I, I don't envision that that Adam necessarily had millions upon millions of different animals and reptiles and snakes and fish to name. Um, I, I think it was more of kind of along the general lines of um, the different classes of animals that we see. Um, I, I don't know exactly how many of them there were, uh, but kind of in the same way that, that I explained the flood last week, right? 
Um, I don't necessarily know that the entire world can flood with just raindrops in 40 days or 40 nights, but you, you, you understand how God uses the water from beneath the ground, the, 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 the springs of the deep burst forth, the floodgates of the heavens open. Um, and then I think you can begin to understand how this happens. I think it, that's kind of the same way that I picture this. It, it's not that, that Adam from sun up to sundown was just, all right, those are crickets, okay, those are mosquitoes, okay, those are African flying mosquitoes, those are, you know, uh, Japanese, um, you know, crawling uh, mosquitoes. But whatever the names, I, I think it's just, you know, you, you go through kind of those general names, that's how I envision it. Um, but yeah, I, I, I get that coming through up with a specific name for every single animal, that, that might be a challenge for someone. Um, so I guess that's kind of how I reconcile it in my mind. And I appreciate the fact that this individual who asked this question, he said, my problem is not with God's ability to create anything. My problem is how can, how can this human being accomplish such a great task in the matter of what appears to be a couple of hours? Okay, good. Well, at least you're not denying some power from God. So that being said, um, I, I think, yeah, to make it more manageable in my mind, um, I don't envision there being kind of this endless line of every single different type of insect and reptile and, um, I don't know, anything you, anything you just want to add to that or talk about as far as that's concerned? Why is the mention of fish? So do you mean livestock, birds? Yeah, um, it, it, it could have been simply because um, how, how is he, he going to necessarily see those things, right? Those are out in the sea, those are out in the ocean. And I think that's, that's where you get um, just that general understanding again then that there were fish, right? Not necessarily every different type of fish. Um, I, I think there are, are still sometimes, right, um, animals that are found in, low, in remote places in the world. We don't have a name for it, right? So we come up with a name. I think a lot of those names are probably names that people have come up with over time. So I don't necessarily envision Adam finding every single different type of species. I think it's those that Adam, for the most part, is going to interact with on a day-to-day -day basis. Right? Those animals that he's going to see and encounter. Um, that's, I guess, how I've understood it. It's a good question. So, the, the Hebrew word that's translated Yes. Yeah, it, it's more just a sea creature. Um, and that's kind of how we, that's the, the, the word that we see the Lord use back in chapter 1. So, good question. Um, so, Adam um, keeps this practice of naming the animals. And um, he, he's kind of in this mode, and now God gives him this gift, which is greater than all of the animals he sees someone who is like him. He, he sees this amazing creation from God um, that God basically says here. Um, and, and so Adam says, um, okay, what am I going to call this one? Um, and I don't know if you recognize or understand the way that language and words work, but this is literally what the word woman means, right? Out of man, the, the, the Hebrew word there. Um, to be taken out of or to come from man. And so it's kind of this amazing thing, right? As we, we get into creation, God uses man to create woman. In, in essence, right, making sure that we recognize woman came from man, and yet moving forward, you don't get any more men without women. Um, it will be women who will bring forth children into the world. Um, and so God uses man from which he has woman, and then moving forward it will be from woman, um, we now have more men and women. I just think it's kind of neat how God uses that, that interdependency um, that you see between men and women. Um, the, the poem that, that Adam speaks here is, is just beautiful in, in, in Hebrew. Um, <clears throat> this is now bone of my bones, Flesh of my flesh, um, I always tell um, uh, couples that I take through pre-marriage counseling, um, I, I tell them, uh, if you want to write your own vows for your wedding, you can. 
But they have to be better than this. This is the litmus test. Um, and every time um, a, a couple kind of looks at it and says, well, this is two lines. Right? How do you not do better than two lines? Um, and, and then I, I, I take them into kind of the, the Hebrew and, um, and, and, and you, you get to see the joy and excitement that Adam has. And, and really, in essence, what he says is, at last. Um, here she is. You, you, you can imagine, kind of, as Adam's mind begins to work, as he sees the, the cows, and as he sees the sheep, and as he sees the, the tigers, and the lions, and the donkeys, and every other animal kind of walk through, and he realizes there's, there's two of everything. And yet I don't see a single other thing like me. When, when is this other one coming? At last. Um, here she is. And, and what an amazing way for a husband to, to view his wife. Um, at last. Um, this, this, this is, aside from grace and God's forgiveness given to us in Jesus Christ, there is no greater gift that I have in this love, this life than my wife. At last. Um, Number uh, verse 24. God established marriage and family when he brought Adam, or brought Eve to Adam. You look at verse 24, um, and we see now we're kind of moving forward, right? Here's how it's going to work going forward. For this reason, because this is how God created man and woman. Because this is what God has done in the first couple, Adam and Eve. This is what will happen moving forward. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. And it's kind of interesting. I think here again is another example of something we see God do in creation and play out even in the 21st century. This is no offense to any of you mama's boys out there, but I think for the most part, when it comes to a husband and a wife, who is it that remains closest to their family after they get married? Typically the wife, isn't it? Um, and I'm not throwing her under the bus. This is not a bad thing. It's just the way that it works in, in my family. Um, my wife talks to her mother or her sister every single day, sometimes both of them. Um, if if I don't call my mom once a month, she, she kind of wonders what's up. And if I'm being honest, she calls me a lot of times and I, I don't have time to answer. Um, I, don't, I don't feel that connection to my family. I have my family. I have my wife. I have my daughter. That is my family. Um, but, but for my wife, there still is that need. She goes home uh, back to Michigan you know, three, four, five times a year. I go back about once or once every two, three years. That's kind of my goal. Um, I don't feel that that longing, that connection to, to, to maintain it. Not because I don't love my family. I have an amazing family. I love my family. Um, but I just I think you see this most commonly in, in the way husbands and wives interact with their family. The wives are typically going to be and remain closer to their families. And I'm always reminding this of, of, of couples. Um, when, um, especially kind of in that, that pre-marriage counseling setting, um, when, when you, you ask kind of, how are your relationships with your, your families, your potential in-laws? Well, she just talks to her mom every day. We'll get used to it. <laughs> That's not going to change. And it, it, it ne doesn't necessarily have to. Just because you don't doesn't mean that she doesn't feel that need um, to still talk to her mom or her dad or her siblings. Um, that's not what God says here. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. And I think more times than not, that's the way that it works. Right? That's the way that it is. Um, <clears throat> and the two will become one flesh. There, there's that, that unity that we see God instilling um, in a man and a woman, a husband and a wife, they're, they're not just kind of hanging out. They're not just, you know, around to have a good time. They're not just keeping each other company. 
It's not just companionship. Um, it's literally, in God's eyes, this combining of two human beings into one. That's the connection. That's, that's the way that God designs it. That's the way that marriage works. And so that changes the way now I, as a husband, live and act. Um, I don't do things because they're, they're going to benefit me and hurt my wife. Because if they're going to hurt my wife, then by association, by union, they will also hurt me. And, and, and there is a practical application there, isn't there? Right? Something about guys being in the doghouse. Right? You hang out with the fellows too late, too often. What happens? What you did to benefit yourself and hurt your wife, in the end, what? Cost you. Right? They, this is not anything deep that you have to think about. You know how that works. Um, and, and so this, this beautiful connection, obviously there's, there's, a, there's a sexual uh, relation here, there's a sexual image that's being placed, the two becoming one, but it's so much more than that. Um, and then verse 25, the man and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. Awkward way to end chapter 2, but wait till we get to chapter 3. Um, we'll get there in lesson 4, um, and, and we'll, we'll talk about why that statement is so important. Okay. Um, so, that is chapter 2. Thoughts, questions, reactions. Okay. Here is what I want to get into then tonight. Um, <clears throat> page 17, Creation, Evolution, and Science. Take a look at your notes there. The first chapters of Genesis together with several other verses throughout the Bible, clearly describe a world that was created by the power of God's Word. God said, let there be, and there was. Modern science and academia, however, espouse the theory of evolution as the accepted explanation for the origins of our world and universe. The biblical account of creation is in direct contrast with atheistic evolution, which suggests that our universe evolved by chance without any divine direction or plan. Atheistic or without or apart from God, um, atheistic evolution clearly contradicts the Bible's record of our world's origins. Some have suggested, however, that the creation account and the theory of evolution are still compatible with each other. Theistic evolution is proposed as a way to harmonize the two perspectives. This theory states that God used the Big Bang and the process of evolution to create the universe and our world. According to this theory, the days in Genesis uh, chapter 1 are actually extended periods of time, marked by the major life forms that evolved during that period. So you've got the prehistoric period, and you've got the Mesozoic period, and you've got the Ice Age, and you've got the Stone Age, and all of those come from this kind of understanding. Okay. So here's the question. Are the biblical accounts of creation and modern science's theory of evolution compatible with each other or in conflict with one another? Remember that from a scientific standpoint, both creation and evolution are theories or models. Neither can absolutely be proven. However, there is a great deal of scientific evidence available that supports the Bible's creation account, evidence that unfortunately is often unreported and discussed. Before we dismiss or accept the biblical account of creation, let's look at some evidence. Below are some samplings of scientific evidence from data and data from the biblical record. Before we get into those four laws of science and uh, evolution, or science, uh, four laws of science versus evolution, I want to show you a video. I mentioned it last week. Um, it's like four minutes, not very long, but I think it kind of points out some interesting things, um, at least to me. Um, and, and that is, instead of kind of looking at, right, evolution versus uh, creation or God versus science, you kind of have to pick one or the other. Um, the question is kind of rephrased in this video to ask, does science prove or at least argue for or against God? 
Okay? And remember what science is. Science is the practice of observation. Right? Science is observing what we see in nature, in chemicals, in, in, in whatever it is that, that you want to talk about. Um, and it's observing those things and then testing them and coming to a conclusion. Right? So science is viewed as, here's what we test, here's what we know, here's what we come up with. Um, and so it's viewed as kind of this bulletproof practice. Um, and when you follow science... To a T, it really is. Um, because in order to come up with a scientific law, there can be no known exceptions in the world. Right? Because if you can't observe it, and if you can't recreate it in a sense, um, then it cannot be something that science says, this is absolutely 100% positively true. So, does science, the things that we observe in the world, in, the na in nature, in the universe around us, does science argue for or against God, a, a creator? Um, take a look at this video. In 1966, Time Magazine ran a cover story asking, Is God Dead? The cover reflected the fact that many people had accepted the cultural narrative that God is obsolete, that as science progresses, there's less need for a God to explain the universe. It turns out, though, that the rumors of God's death were premature. In fact, perhaps the best arguments for his existence come from, of all places, science itself. Here's the story. The same year Time featured its now famous headline, the astronomer Carl Sagan announced that there were two necessary criteria for a planet to support life, the right kind of star and a planet the right distance from that star. Given the roughly octillion planets in the universe, that's one followed by 24 zeros, there should have been about septillion planets, that's one followed by 21 zeros, capable of supporting life. With such spectacular odds, Scientists were optimistic that the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, known by its initials SETI, an ambitious project launched in the 1960s, was sure to turn up something soon. With a vast radio telescopic network, scientists listened for signals that resembled coded intelligence. But as the years passed, the silence from the universe was deafening. As of 2014, researchers have discovered precisely bubkis. Nada, zilch, which is to say zero, followed by an infinite number of zeros. What happened? As our knowledge of the universe increased, it became clear that there were, in fact, far more factors necessary for life, let alone intelligent life, than Sagan supposed. His two parameters grew to 10, then 20, and then 50, which meant that the number of potentially life-supporting planets decreased accordingly. The number dropped to a few thousand planets and kept on plummeting. Even SETI proponents acknowledged the problem. Peter Schenkel wrote in a 2006 piece for Skeptical Inquirer, a magazine that strongly affirms atheism, in light of new findings and insights, we should quietly admit that the early estimates may no longer be tenable. Today, there are more than 200 known parameters necessary for a planet to support life, every single one of which must be perfectly met or the whole thing falls apart. For example, without a massive gravity-rich planet like Jupiter nearby to draw away asteroids, Earth would be more like an interstellar dartboard than the verdant orb that it is. Simply put, the odds against life in the universe are astonishing. Yet, here we are, not only existing, but talking about existing. What can account for it? Can every one of those many parameters have been perfectly met by accident? At what point is it fair to admit that it is science itself that suggests that we cannot be the result of random forces? Doesn't assuming that an intelligence created these perfect conditions in fact require far less faith than believing that a life-sustaining Earth just happened to beat the inconceivable odds? But wait, there's more. The fine-tuning necessary for life to exist on a planet is nothing compared with the fine-tuning required for the universe to exist at all. For example, 
Astrophysicists now know that the values of the four fundamental forces, gravity, the electromagnetic force, and the strong and weak nuclear forces, were determined less than one millionth of a second after the Big Bang. Alter any one of these four values ever so slightly, and the universe as we know it could not exist. For instance, if the ratio between the strong nuclear force and the electromagnetic force had been off by the tiniest fraction of the tiniest inconceivable fraction, then no stars could have formed at all. Multiply that single parameter by all the other necessary conditions, and the odds against the universe existing are so heart-stoppingly astronomical that the notion that it all just happened defies common sense. It would be like tossing a coin and having it come up heads ten quintillion times in a row. I don't think so. Fred Hoyle, the astronomer who coined the term Big Bang, said that his atheism was greatly shaken by these developments. One of the world's most renowned theoretical physicists, Paul Davies, has said that the appearance of design is overwhelming. Even the late Christopher Hitchens, one of atheism's most aggressive proponents, conceded that without question the fine-tuning argument was the most powerful argument of the other side. Oxford University professor of mathematics, Dr. John Lennox, has said, the more we get to know about our universe, the more the hypothesis that there is a creator gains in credibility as the best explanation of why we are here. The greatest miracle of all time is the universe. It is the miracle of all miracles, one that inescapably points to something or someone beyond itself. I'm Eric Metaxas for Prager University. Join Prager University. Click here to subscribe. All right. Um, someone pointed that video out to me a while back, and I, I don't know um, a whole lot about Prager University. I don't even know who this gentleman is that, that does the video. Um, I don't necessarily know that I agree that the the universe is the, the greatest miracle of all time. It certainly is a miracle and, and certainly up there. Um, but the point is, I'm showing this to you, um, is what is oftentimes called the cosmological argument. And that is when it comes to the cosmos, right, the, the world in which we live, in order for it not only to have human life, life in general, but to have intelligent life on top of that. You, you see some of the parameters that he points out that have to be not just in the ballpark, but precisely exact in order for life to exist and to continue to exist. And, and how quickly after, he's not, he's not a proponent of the Big Bang um, when he made that statement, um, he said, scientists um, estimate that after the Big Bang, all four of those things, when it comes to um, gravity and the strong and weak nuclear force, those, those, those four subjects that he mentioned, um, in order for life to exist and to, to have all of the parameters line up exactly the way that they need for life to exist, they needed to happen after that Big Bang in less than a millisecond. So the idea, again, of just give it time, and, and that's always, I think, what the conversations that I've had with people who um, hold to evolution, that's always the go-to, right? If you give it enough time, eventually, right, these things can happen. But they're not saying it took time. They're saying it, it had to happen immediately. So the idea of time ultimately isn't one that they even recognize that they can use. Um, so I, I just I think this video is good to, to at least kind of show you. I don't know. I'm, I'm assuming this guy is some sort of a Christian, um, but as we'll see, a lot of proponents um, that we see in the scientific community um, who are starting to recognize, and you saw a number of the names that he pointed out. This idea of intelligent design are not even theists. They're still atheists. But they keep coming back to this idea that, man, the odds 
I don't care how much time you give it. I don't, I don't care how many times you flip that quarter. Um, in order to get those odds to fit, give it trillions and, and, and trillions of years. It's just the odds are not going to allow all of those things to happen. Especially that quickly. So, take it for what it's worth. I, I found it um, interesting at least. So I thought I would share it with you. Um, a couple other things uh, to take a look at those first law, the four laws of science. The first one there, the, the first law of thermodynamics, energy cannot be created or destroyed on its own. Um, and, and that's something you probably uh, remember maybe in, maybe in physics class, right? I remember when I was in physics class, we had the block of wood on, on four wheels, right? And in order for energy to be created, what did you have to do? Push. You had to, yeah, you had to push the, the block of wood, right? That's how energy, it, it's, it, it's just, you can't let it sit there and not have anything affect it and all of a sudden have it start moving on its own. You've got to tilt the table or you've got to blow on it or you've got to push it or something. Energy doesn't, isn't just created on its own, right? Um, yeah, we, we recognize that. Um, it's not created on its own. It has a creator, right? God says, let there be, and, and there is energy. Um, and, and yet, here's where, again, evolution, I, again, I'm not claiming to be in, uh, some master of evolution, um, but I, I guess this is kind of where, whether you use the Big Bang or, or it's just simply, where's the beginning of all of this? At some point, we had to go from no energy to energy. And, and, and atheistic evolution, at least, espouses the idea that energy had to somehow go from nothing to something without anything affecting it. The first law of science says that that doesn't happen. The second law of thermodynamics, the usefulness of energy is constantly decreasing. You, you, you push that, that block of wood and eventually what happens? Stops. Right? Because it's always decreasing. You can't, you can't just kind of nudge that, that block of wood and then expect it to circle the globe nonstop as it picks up speed. Uh, just the usefulness of energy is always decreasing. In, in other words, and I think kind of a, a layman's way to, to explain this is things are always getting worse. They're not improving. They're not getting better. The car isn't going faster. Things are slowing down. Things are getting worse. Um, and the example that I always use with my catechism kids is, tell me if you think your, your mom, when she comes into your room and sees clothes everywhere and dresser drawers open and it's just destroyed and your bed is not made, and she comes in and says, pick up your room. Do you think she would buy the uh, reason you gave her if you said, you know what, mom, just give it time and it will all pick up itself? Because that's the way the world works. Well, the second law of thermodynamics, and your mom recognized that doesn't happen, right? Um, things are getting worse. Don't mow your lawn or water it or, 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 or you know, spray it for, for any pesticides all summer. Just leave it. Are you going to have the nicest looking lawn in your neighborhood by the end of the summer? That, that's unfathomable for you, isn't it, Troy? Mm -hmm. Troy's got the most beautiful lawn I'm always envious. Um, it gets worse. You get weeds, right? You, you get crabgrass. You get all of these things that show you things do not get better. But what does evolution say? We started out with practically nothing or a little bit of something. And ultimately, now look at what we have. You can't tell me that for millions and maybe even billions of years, things had to progressively get a whole lot better than how they started. But science says, no, here's a law. <laughs> things do not get better. And we recognize that. And we don't deny that. And lesson four will tell us why that is. We'll get into lesson four, the fall into sin, and God says this perfect creation that I, that I made, um, now it's all ruined. Um, and, and, and we'll see what this now means for God's creation. And science shows that now. The third one, law of biogenesis. Life comes from life. Right? And we talked about that a little bit last week. This is... I think kind of obvious, right? You can't bang two rocks together and expect to get something living, 
right? Um, it, you need a living creature in order to give life to something else that is living. Um, and yet, evolution through that. At some point, we had to go from no life to life, right? Whether that life was plants or animals or human beings, it had to ultimately come from something that was not life. The law of biogenesis says no. The fourth one, the law of genetics, life is propagated within the boundary of kinds, right? We talked about that too. If you make two cats, I don't care how long you do it, how many times you do it, you're going to get a cat. You don't get a dog, right? Because they're not the same kind. If it walks like a cat, talks like a cat, it must be a duck. Yeah, and, and we know why that is, right? We saw last week, how many times, was it seven times we heard God repeat that, right? Created plants and vegetation and trees and animals according to their kinds, according to their kinds, according to their kinds. We see that out in nature and we say, you can't make these two things and get a totally different species, right? It just doesn't happen. You can now, you can crossbreed and you can try and, and really come up with some funky stuff. But in the end, I don't care what kind of dogs you try and mate with each other. Um, in the end, you're still going to get another type of dog, right? I don't care what the National Enquirer said. Um, there is no such thing as the Bat Boy. I send this to, to my kids. They don't even know what the National Enquirer is. You guys remember that magazine? That was my, that was my, that was the only reason I was ever willing to go with my mom to the grocery store because we probably get to the checkout lane and I just look at the front cover and see this bald-headed kid with bat ears and fangs and wings and some woman had given birth to a Bat Boy. Um, yeah, we know those things don't exist because we know that the law of genetics says that doesn't happen. Um, so I, I just think that there, there's a, a couple of examples where you say, here are some, some of the most fundamental laws in science, and not a single one of them disagree with the creation account. I'm sure they have answers, I'm sure they have responses, um, and maybe it's just as simple as, well, the early stages of evolution are the exception. I don't know, maybe there's something more logical or more more uh, academic that they would say, but, but I, I think my point is instead of using these to, to necessarily attack evolution, I, I like to use these to simply show support of creation. Creation does not go contrary to any of these fundamental laws of science. Um, <clears throat> thoughts on those? Okay, turn the page. It, we, we won't spend a lot of time on these. I just kind of like to go through some of these. We heard the video mention uh, Sir Fred Hoyle. Um, he he has um, recently passed a couple of years ago. Um, take a look at uh, one of Britain's foremost scientists, a non-Christian by his own admission, right? Uh, so this is not just like it's, right? You either have atheistic scientists or you have uh, creation Christians. You, you, you have, I think, a lot in both camps. You'll find people who claim to be Christians and believe in evolution. And you'll have scientists who do not believe in God and yet say, like Sir Fred Hoyle here, uh, the probability of an evolutionary origin of life is equal to the probability that a tornado sweeping through a junkyard would assemble a Boeing 747. The probability of evolving uh, of life evolving on Earth in five billion years, I think it's up to six and a half an hour, something like that, is one chance out of ten to the 40,000th power. I don't know how I came up with that number, but I think his point is pretty clear, right? Um, how many tornadoes uh, ripping through how many junkyards are not just going to kind of assemble something that could resemble a plane, but he's talking about a, a fully functioning plane. Remember that when we look out in the world and the universe around us, we're not just a bunch of bumbling idiots with arms coming out of our heads um, who don't know how to talk and communicate. Um, this is intelligent life, right? Functioning life. Um, and, and I think that's kind of the point that he's making. Um, another one, the, the, the fossil record. Um, and, and you hear this from time to time, and, and, and I'm sure there have been probably more claims than I've been able to find. Um, I think this is the most recent one that I have seen. This was the, 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 the latest, I think this was like 2006 or something. This was kind of the fossil that was claimed to be the missing link. 
Um, it, to me, it doesn't look like much of a link. Um, I, I don't know. I just This is one that they've used. And yet, I, I think if you still ask kind of the larger scientific community, um, although there's talk of a missing link, uh, there has never been a discovery of a transitional fossil between vertebrates and invertebrates, between fish and amphibians, or between primates and man. If, and here's what I think is the most important part. If one creature evolved into another over millions or even billions of years, there should be hundreds or thousands of transitional fossils. Moreover, we should see examples of these transitional forms in life in, life in our world today. It's not like we're trying to find a needle in a haystack here. Right? If you're talking about from this to this, took two billion years, then you have two billion years worth of that transition taking place. It really shouldn't be that difficult then to find that missing link, should it? I, I, again, maybe there are, are those out there, no doubt there are those out there who know more than I do, but that just seems to me like, again, we're not talking about, you know, all of a sudden, boom to boom. It, it, there has to be evolution, says this transition, this transitional period, and it doesn't happen like that. Um, there has to be kind of this slow process, and so how many thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of fossils should there be? And listen, missing, I guess. Yeah. What's the source of that? What is the source of that? Um, yeah, the, the question was, you know, what, what, if, what if someone just, you know, denies this or says, no, they have, and here they are. Um, yeah, like I said, I, this is one of the examples given as, you know, we've, we found a transitional fossil. And, and I've read the article on it, um, and I've, I've looked into some of these things, and I just, I, I don't know where they come up with why this fits the criteria. Um, I mean, to, to me, this is... How is that not, you can see the vertebrae in the picture. I, I, but for some reason, this is the, the missing link. I, I don't know. I, I wish I could give you an answer. I, I don't know. Um, Eric? I can simply ask for that evidence. OK. And I, I, if, if, if then somebody does come back to something, I am able to take it with a little to no education myself. OK. Yeah. You know, you're, you're kind of making stuff up here. But, you know, come up with theories based on what? Two, three bones? It, it's really usually a lack of evidence that somebody built a whole fictional story around. Okay. Yeah, and, and I think more times than that, that, that I guess is one of my challenges, or one of my struggles that I have with evolution is a lot of times it's we found this which we can then use to prove what we've already decided is true. But that, that's not science, right? No, uh, you, you, can put up, you can put on a lab coat and call yourself a scientist, but I guess in, in my mind, coming up with, um, here's what we know to be true, now let's go look for evidence that proves it. Um, because I think I, I know too much how the human mind works, right? When I have my mind made up about something, I can justify it pretty easily, whether or not it's right or wrong, uh, because I, I, I can kind of make things say what I want. So I think, yeah, that's probably a fair thing to, to say, to point out. Um, I, I think it is. I, you know, a lot of times I think it's, you know, and, and maybe I think this is true with Christians as well. I, I, I wish that, that, that as Christians we, we were more educated on the theory of evolution. And I think that's something that I bring up with uh, my 7th and 8th graders that I teach. Um, is we, we talk about evolution a lot. Not in, as a, you know, let's put this down and it's dumb and stupid. Um, but I realize that when they get to high school, when they get into college, this is, is not going to be taught as a theory anymore. And so I, I want to be able to teach it to you in light of God's Word and show you that what we see in the creation accounts, are, are, these are not things that are disproved by science. Whereas, here's where I come a lot of times in, in evolution is, here's what we want, and kind of here's how we get there. I, I heard the example once, and I don't know how, how valid it is, but it kind of made sense to me. Um, it, it's, you know, you kind of envision, 
Um, you, you throw a rock um, out into a, a pond, right? And someone is standing on shore, and eventually the ripples of water make their way back to their feet. You weren't the one who threw the rock. You, you, you don't know exactly what it was. But what do you see, right? From the shoreline, you get maybe that much. Here's what I see. And, and I think what you have in evolution is now we take this, what we see, and we can make categorical truths about not only the size, the shape, the weight of the rock, but who threw it, where it landed, and how long ago it was thrown. Um, whereas, again, and I've acknowledged this, when you, you judge creation and evolution purely by that scientific method, um, creation itself is a theory. But in that theory, we have not only the rock, but the one who threw it, how he threw it, what he said, where it began, and then he gives us these rings, and none of them contradict the story that he tells of how it began. That, to me, I think, is easier in my mind to say, okay, here's the story, instead of, here's this, and here's what we can then say factually about this. Because just, and I recognize people will say, well, science itself is evolving. Um, and, and yet, think of just in, in the last, the examples in the last, you know, 200 years, how seeing this meant this. Well, now we know seeing this doesn't mean that at all. It means something entirely different. Um, so, sure, evo or science changes, uh, evolution changes. Um, this account of creation hasn't changed. And, and nothing that we see in the world around us would show that it needs to change. So if you want to look at them both as theories, um, I, I guess I take it as, I, in my mind and in my heart, this theory has more credibility than this. Um, and, and I recognize that ultimately it comes back to, number one, trusting that this book is God's Word. That a God who exists recorded these words, preserved them throughout history. Um, I realize it takes that faith. But you open up a textbook um, in, in science class or a physics class, um, and you're, you're really doing the same thing. You're not the one running those experiments. You're not the one who's there to, to find those bones and, and figure out what they are, you're taking someone else at their word. Um, well, hey, uh, uh, the only religious book that has yet to be any conflict with science or history, uh, to take any other religious writing in any way, yeah. that goes in depth in any way, that will have contradictions right. in today's day and age. Right. Okay, Randall. John, sorry, right? I don't have a better answer for anything. Yeah. Um, another one, uh, The Receding Moon, you can read that one. Um, you can actually read the, the rest of them. I think, I think kind of an interesting one, uh, DNA evidence. Second one from the bottom there, I think to me is interesting. And I recognize that this is a, a 1995 report, um, but it, as far as I know, it, it still hasn't changed. The 1995 report in U.S. News and World, uh, the report describes genetic studies conducted about eight years earlier in which it was discovered that all human beings descended from one woman. An Associated Press story in November of that same year reported another study in which we learned that every man can trace his Y chromosome to one man. Um, and, and, and I know there, there's been amazing technological advances in um, you know, DNA addition and subtraction and genome mapping um, it, it's kind of amazing, you know, what we can do and find out and discover as human beings, but the fact remains, we still don't know how to take something dead and to actually make it alive. That's that transition that we recognize we don't know how it happened and we cannot recreate it. Um, and yet it's kind of the foundational belief in evolution that ultimately at one point that's what had to happen. 
Um, an almighty creator God says, well, this is how I created human beings. Um, that last one there, I think, isn't really necessarily a scientific one, but I just think it's kind of interesting to, to look at. If the days in Genesis 1 were long periods of time, and I, and I get this again, and, and I think this is where a lot of Christians try, and we mentioned this idea of theistic evolution, I think this is where you get a lot of Christians who try and say, well, I don't want to deny necessarily what science supposedly says, but I also don't want to necessarily you know, deny what the Bible says, so we try and right, mix and match and change and shape, and instead of you know, wanting to change science, they change God's Word. And they change the Bible by saying the days there, you know, maybe they were a thousand years. Maybe a day, quote unquote, is something that you know God used as as uh, kind of his lingo for a thousand years or whatever it might be. Well, think about it this way: if the days in Genesis chapter one were long periods of time, what would happen to the Earth's temperature? Um, if the daytime and nighttime were in fact millions of years, how could life develop under those conditions? Uh, because notice what God says. Day one, day two, there was evening and there was morning. There was evening and there was morning. He says that repeatedly after every single day. Um, and so if you're going to try and change what those nights are um, into kind of this one long, giant, thousand long year day, um, what, what is this, there was evening and there was morning? Not over and over a thousand times within that one day, but on day one, there was evening and there was morning. So do you have you know, 500 years of darkness for evening and 500 years of light. How, how, does, how does life evolve under those conditions? Um, here's where I want to end tonight. It is just um, the, the biblical record. The immediate context, the continuous refrain in Genesis chapter 1, there was evening and there was morning the first day. Um, although the word day, uh, in Hebrew it's the word yom, can be used in other senses. The context defines its use here. So the, the, the Hebrew language can use the word day a lot like we do, right? Uh, if you come home to your family and say, man, I just had the longest day at work. Do you literally mean that you worked a 24-hour shift? Probably not, right? Um, but you don't need to clarify that. Your family understands you're using day in a different way, right? You're using it to describe a work day. They get that. We can use the word day in a different way. But remember, the context defines its use. Um, what is the context in Genesis chapter 1? Evening and morning. There was evening and morning. Evening and morning. Um, what does a period of evening and a period of morning mean for us in the context of a day? It means one 24-hour period. Um, additionally, the word day is never used in Scripture to express thousands, millions, or billions of years. It's not used like that anywhere in Scripture. Um, when God says day, or when the Bible says day, um, it's not used in any other way, because, again, the context defines that. And so I think it's interesting just to kind of take a look at um, Exodus chapter 20, verse uh, 11. <laughs> this is when uh, God is giving the Ten Commandments to the people of Israel. This is what he says. He says, For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So God, in giving his Old Testament people the commandments, he gets to that third commandment, right? Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Do you know enough about the Jewish culture, about the Old Testament? How long was the Sabbath? Was it a thousand years long? It was a day. It was Sabbath, right? Um, and, and maybe you even know this, um, the reason that we have in Genesis chapter 1, there was evening and there was morning, day 1, um, is because the way that um, the, 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 the Jewish people marked the day was um, the new day began um, at, in, the, in the evening. And the day ended when the sun went down. Which actually, I think, makes more sense than the way we do it. Right? Why does a new day begin in the middle of the night when everybody's sleeping? I don't know. How or when or why that started, maybe you do. 
But it makes sense that a day would end, right? And I, I think, obviously, we still we have manufactured light, so we can function at night, right? You, you go back in time and you don't have that. If the sun goes down, your day is over, right? So the day ends. Um, and that new day begins, right? And so the evening was really the first part of their day. The morning, the sunlight, was the latter half of their day. So when God says there was evening and there was morning, that was their day. Um, and God uses <clears throat> his own experience in creation to set the example for his people. I rested on the seventh day. You are going to rest on the seventh day. I rested for a 24-hour period. I stopped creating on that day. This is how long you will rest. How long was the Sabbath? It was 24 hours. There's no, there's no reason to try and change this or, 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 or fix this. Um, I guess it's my fault. So, all right, we're going to stop there. Um, but before we do, we're not going to answer them tonight. But if you do have a question and it's fresh in your mind, I want to have you ask it now, and I'll write it down, and we'll begin next time with it. So if anybody has a question, if not, if your kind of wheels are turning, I got a question on us, I don't know how to word it. Think about it. Either text it to me or email it to me this week, or if you can remember it, write it down, bring it next week, and we'll talk about it. Okay. All right. So we'll finish this lesson next week. There's not much left to talk about. We'll get into lesson four. Okay. Let's close with a prayer tonight. Gracious Lord God, how awesome it is to be able to hear your word and to see um, the, the beginnings of our, our universe, uh, uh, your creation. Um, how amazing it is to see uh, with such great grace and, 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 and time and effort and delicacy you put into creating uh, humanity. Uh, Lord God, we see the care and the love that you have um, for mankind, uh, for all of humanity. Uh, Lord, we see that not only in the created universe around us, but we most clearly see that uh, in the love that you give to us and show to us in your Son, Jesus. Uh, as we approach this time in the church here, Lord, as we get closer to Holy Week, uh, to the time when we focus most specifically on your passion, on your suffering, your death, and your resurrection, uh, Lord, let us see that love, that grace more and more. Um, thank you, Lord, for allowing everyone to come here tonight, uh, guide them home safely, uh, grant them your grace uh, the, these next couple of days, um, and, and bring them back so we can again dig into your word and grow in our relationship with you. We ask this all in your saving name.